It's a working library. It's a library stuffed full of, of books from all the way around the world. And all these books, each of the books in this library, are written by someone who's been forced into exile. Language is migratory. It's diasporic. It moves across countries all the time. And written into the walls is this extraordinary deep history of, of the destroyed libraries of the world. So when you've written your name in a book in this library, you know that next year this book will be in a library in Mosul. So it's a history of exile. But more than that, it's a celebration of an extraordinary world of, of people who have had to move, migrate across borders. Hello, welcome to the British Museum. I'm Christina Tubb, a member of the adult programs team here in the museum. It's my great pleasure to introduce our speakers today. Richard Ovenden, director of the world famous Bodleian Libraries, will be discussing his fascinating new book, Burning Books, A History of Knowledge Under Attack. He is joined by artist, writer and creator of the museum's current library of exile installation, Edmund Duval. We are indebted to our sponsors, the AKO Foundation, whose generosity and vision has made this event one of a series in the public program possible, as well as the installation itself. We are committed to continuing to deliver thought-provoking, accessible online events during what has been an unprecedented year. And with the museum being forced to close its doors for the third time since the beginning of 2020, your continued support is greatly appreciated. Lastly, I'm delighted to say that today's event will have BSL interpretation available on a separate YouTube stream. Please do follow the link in the chat if you would like to access this. And so without further ado, it gives me great pleasure to welcome our esteemed guests, Edmund, Richard, over to you. And hundreds of people, almost a thousand people from joining us from dozens of countries all around the world. And it's a huge pleasure because Richard has written the most extraordinary book. It's the most compelling book, uh, a book of, of great power and reach. And Richard, we have 40 minutes, 45 minutes together. Um, and I'm not quite sure where we're going to begin um, or where we're going to end. But I do want to tell everyone um, who's, who's joining us tonight that there will be 15 minutes at the end to ask um, searching questions of you via me. Um, but where are we going to begin? We could begin with an extraordinary thing very near the start of your book, where you talk about the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in South Africa. Um, and you talk compellingly about the fact that they were hampered by the destruction of huge quantities of apartheid era documents, that their archive was destroyed. And, and you quote the Re Truth and Reconciliation Committee. The story of apartheid is amongst other things, the story of the systematic elimination of thousands of voices that should have been part of the national memory. Archives, memory and destruction, Richard. These seem to be core themes for yeah, you. They absolutely are. And I think that um, part of the reason for writing this book is to raise across the globe the uh, awareness of the vitality of the preservation of knowledge for the health of society for the health of communities for the health of indiv individuals our fellow citizens and I think we've sleepwalked I think into an era of complacency about these issues and about the role that libraries and archives play and the way that we have seen systematic, targeted, deliberate destruction and continue to experience it right up to today. And I think that the, you know, what happened in South Africa is a fantastic example of how knowledge and the kind of the, its preservation and its openness, its accessibility for all sorts of reasons, whether legal or cultural, artistic, educational, um, 
is so important for communities, for society. So, so what you're doing right at the very beginning of, or right at the very beginning of your book is you you is you very clearly say that libraries and archives are, are overlap, but they have have slightly different functions. Can we begin at the beginning? there and then delve into into those the, those those parallel histories of why people might want to destroy them yeah sure well i think um and th th this is a kind of great generalization what i'm about to say comes with a health warning mm. um and um so libraries to me are collections of individual books you know like your fantastic book that goes with your amazing show um and they have been accumulated over time by librarians by people choosing to gather them together and um there's a kind of intellectual structure around them there are classification systems that help um you know arrange them um there are kind of guiding principles behind them Archives are slightly different in that they are reflections of an organization. So whether that organization is a company, we've got the archive of Marconi, the corporation, um, you know, in the Bodleian. And, you know, it, there are minutes of the board, the board meetings, there are finance records, there are yeah, HR records, there are... Um, project documents you know and they're, they're very kind of clear series but they actually reflect the organization itself and those those archival documents can also equally apply to a government department to a whole country in terms of you know the national archives of uh, the uk in in queue so they are reflective of um of society itself and archives can also have a kind of personal component and that's a bit where kind of libraries and archives kind of over overlap quite a lot where you have the archive of an individual you know we have the archives of seven prime ministers in the bodley and so their their papers reflect somewhat their own lives and the, there are kind of series within them that reflect their own careers and their own kind of personal relationships and so on and and um, those professions around libraries and archives have been um, have been professions for a relatively short period of time, actually, for really only for a couple of hundred years. But the roles, I think, actually go back to the beginnings of libraries and archives in the ancient civilizations of Mesopotamia. So what's I mean, one of the extraordinary early stories you, you talk is Ash Bernipal. Um, the, uh, um, yeah. and here, here we are, so virtually in the British maybe, Museum. Maybe we could go to slide three. Um, can, can, you, can, you, can you locate us here? Because this is a very interesting place where yeah. we might talk about the destruction of well, what an archive or library might mean early on and why yeah. someone might want to destroy it. Yeah, well, I think uh, Ashabat, and, and it's great that we're being hosted this conversation by the British Museum because I walked into their wonderful show called I Am Ashabanapal, and it was an absolute revelation for me because right in the heart of this exhibition in one of the world's great museums is a library, and an extraordinary library, a library like I had not seen before, this great library of clay documents almost literally concrete poetry you know there's um and the the curators of the show made this very compelling argument that this is the first recorded instance of a library that tried to accumulate the whole of knowledge as it was understood at the time and ashurbanipal formed that library partly through a kind of destructive act by destroying the libraries of his enemy states in Babylonia. And he, there are accession records which exist, which show that he was sending his agents to target that temple collection, bring these cuneiform mm -hmm. tablets back to my library to make my knowledge base stronger and to weaken theirs. You have a very good line about enforced 
sequestration of knowledge, which I, I, I wrote down in capitals. <laughs> yeah. So, that, so that's early on. This that's is very, early. very early on. That's in the seventh century before the Christian era. That's, uh, uh, and to me, this is a sign that, you know, uh, as Derrida says, you know, there is no um, political power without control over the archive. And that was true, you know, way back um, in, 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 those, in, in that era. Uh, and in a funny sense, the fact that Ashurbanipal's library is, for the most part, in the British Museum is another example of the exercise of power. And to some extent, is a library in exile um, because it was. Uh, and if we go to the um, the, I think the next slide, slide, uh, slide, yes, yeah, slide four, um, you can see Austin Henry Layard sketching in the ruins of Nineveh, um, the lion, you know, he was known as the lion of Nineveh in this country because he brought these great treasures back, including 20,000 cuneiform tablets from, um, from the mounds just outside Mosul. I mean, the sequestration of knowledge. I mean, you know, here we are um, looking back how many millennia? I'm my very bad on dates. No, so this is almost three millennia. Three millennia. And then, and then right at the very end of the book, you know, we, <laughs> We, you, you're talking so um, cogently and, and I have to say angrily uh, about the Second Gulf War and uh, and the way in which the not only there was the destruction of, of libraries, of course, we can get to that, but also this, again, archives, art, particular yep. archives being taken away out of Baghdad. Can you, can you, is that a... I think it's a deliberate uh, parallel you're making. I, I think it is a, a it is a very interesting parallel because, mm -hmm. and it's one where you know some of these issues are I think morally quite kind of clear cut, and others there is, um, you know, they're, they're not they're not so clear cut, and I think the Iraqi archives. Um, that were removed from Iraq in 2005 by the US government um, are, are one of those cases. So there's, you know, Iraq goes through this extraordinary period um, under the Ba'ath Party, under Saddam Hussein's rule, um, and, and the secret police have this sort of incredible power, this hold over the country, and um, their war on the Kurds is understood by the West through a chance discovery of archives in the early 1990s. And an Iraqi expatriate who grew up in London and moved to America called Canon Makia uh, exposed um, the terrors of uh, the Saddamist rule through a very kind of powerful book called Republic of Fear. And that was based on the Kurds capturing Iraqi cities which had archival documents in them. And then fast forward to 2003 and the coalition, the US-led coalition invades Iraq, occupies Baghdad, Canon Makia goes with them and he dis again makes a chance discovery in the central headquarters of the Ba'ath Party um, that their archive is there. And so he immediately sees this as being sort of incredibly important. And he gets a permission from the coalition authority to take it out of the, these kind of basements. And he begins to digitize it in a, in a property which actually had been his parents before they were forced into exile. And then, um, you know, as the kind of the internal conflicts get more and more violent in Iraq, that building where he's digitizing these papers becomes under attack and he argues for the removal of the documents to America. And that's what happens in 2005. And the American forces digitize it and to help use new technology, text and data mining, to search for references to weapons of mass destruction, which of course they never find. But so the archive is removed to protect it from destruction in Baghdad, but then it's it, it, Iraqis no longer have access to it because it becomes under American truck control. It ends up in the Hoover Institution in Stanford in California. And I, I you know, I've been there and 
it's it, it's incredibly difficult to access it. You can't access the original documents. You could only access it online. You could only see it through a dumb terminal. You could only take notes in pencil, and you had to be vetted to it. And you know, one of the points that I make was that actually its return, the fact that it wasn't returned, stopped Iraq from coming to terms with its own past. Our, our archives have agency, or, or, or no, the, the the access to archives gives you agency over discovering recent history, discovering the nuance of, of what's been going on, um, and, and, and can be used in all kinds of ways. So to remove a, a national archive out of the country and then prevent the country of, for, of its genesis having access to it is a very particular thing. And, and, and you make the point, I think, in a very cadenced way that this is something that's happened throughout history. This, is, this, this, uh, this controlling of access to knowledge uh, yeah. through, uh, is, is something that we, we see it 15 years ago in, in, with the Hoover Institute, and, and it, but it's happened throughout history. So where, where else should we look to, 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 to see this happening before? Well, I think you could actually go back to the Reformation in Europe. And uh, perhaps if we were to go, uh, we could choose another slide. We could choose slide five, perhaps. Um, and this is uh, in Glastonbury in Somerset. This is the ruins of Glastonbury Abbey. These are, this is the cloister. This is where the library of Glastonbury Abbey was on the eve of the Reformation and uh, a place which was visited by an extraordinary man called John Leland, a kind of uh, an, an almost forgotten figure from, you know, the Hilary Mantel's world, if you like. Mm -hmm. And he was charged by Henry VIII with travelling around to the libraries of, um, uh, of England to search for evidence to support the king's claim to divorce um, Catherine of Aragon and marry uh, Anne Boleyn, and then to divorce from Rome altogether. And, um, you know, they searched through historical documents. Leland searched for the king for references to there being a church before the Norman Conquest and to the antiquity of the, if you like, the English tradition of leading uh, their, their religion. And um, in the process of doing that, he selected volumes which ended up in the Royal Library. And, you know, some of these these books survive and you can see the inventory number. And um, so that process began of, if you like, sequestration of what we were just talking about. But it ended up in mass destruction. And, you know, the king, Henry, soon became it soon became clear to him that not only could he make these arguments, but actually, if he took if he was bold enough, he could take over the whole of the properties that these great rich um, Catholic institutions owned and seized them himself. He destroyed. He, he deliberately destroys the documents, which proves who owns what. Well, no, he wasn't doing that, but he was dismembering entire institutions, which included libraries and archives. And those libraries and archives were sold as um, um, as part of the goods and chattels. So the Glastonbury, Glastonbury Abbey was dissolved in September uh, uh, 1539 and its property by the commissioners of the dissolution um, were, were then handed out by the king as patronage. And then the, the second wave of the Reformation was even worse. Under Edward VI, a second set of commissioners were charged with visiting more secular institutions like the universities and, uh, and a second wave of destruction, which was much more, if you like, religiously motivated. Let's destroy these heretical books. And um, that happened in, in Oxford, in my own institution, and in the original university library. If we go to um, slide eight, for example, you can see the site of the original university library um, in a 15th century room designed for the purpose, which by um, the end of the 1550s was laid waste. It was empty of books. And of the original 440 books that uh, Leland saw in the 1530s, you know, only 11 have survived today. I mean, I, I mean the, the, it is absolutely devastating. And your, your, your charting of the, dis, of the systematic destruction of these books 
you know, and, and it becomes clear that actually it's that, that there's it's only happenstance sometimes that allows books to con, to to survive, and it's often actually particular people who feel um, a sense of of being a custodian of of something that they can't almost put their finger on. They can't quite work out why it's so significant to, to actually to actually preserve books, but they do. Uh, and, and your library, I mean, you're the, I think, the 25th librarian in this extraordinary <laughs> lineage. Um, you know, if you go back to Bodley himself, I mean, he's a very good example of yeah. someone who has, has this extraordinary passionate sense of, of why books need to survive. If we go to slide seven, you, we can see him in a wonderful portrait miniature by Nicholas Hilliard. Mm -hmm. And uh, and they grew up. They were great friends as children. And um, uh, so what I think in the book happens, and it happens throughout history, and it's happening today, it's happening right now, is that the acts of destruction prompt in individuals an urge to preserve and Bodley was consumed by this as a passion, an extraordinary passion. You know, he saw, he lived through that, that um, the moments of destruction. Although he was a Protestant, he lamented um, that, that what had gone on before. And he, he identified certain reasons why it happened. You know, he said that, you know, the, you know, the, the, the library of the University of Oxford had no endowment or what we today would call an endowment. He said it lacked a, a standing rent for the augmentation of books for officers stipends and for other pertinent occasions and you know he you know paid himself he organized he became a kind of project manager in his retirement putting a new roof on the building designing the bookshelves that you you saw, we saw in the slide earlier um putting books on the shelves endowing my predecessor the first librarian thomas james and making sure that there was a a, a post called bodley's janitor uh, today we call them call her the chief operating officer um whose job it is to you know keep the institution afloat and and there are many other examples and where individuals risk their own lives to preserve knowledge so, so, so this is this is extraordinary i mean it, it is often hugely moving in your book, um, Burning the Books, hugely moving because there you have Bodley in the, you know, um, with his, you know, an arc to save learning, but you, you, you pull that story painfully through um, into, into the 20th century um, in, in, and into yeah. chapters, which for me personally, because of my own family history, um, um, which were, I have to say, part of the part of the strong impetus to create the Library of Exile, um, yeah. um, about the destruction, the attempted destruction of, of Jewish culture in 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 in, in, um, in in Europe in the 20th century, and you do a series of chapters about uh, about from 1933 from 1933 from the first Nazi book burnings, yeah. all the way through into into the particular. Powerful story of 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 Vilna. I'm, yeah. And please, that's a story you have to tell now. Okay, I I feel I feel the need to tell it yeah. actually, yeah. and I was very, you know, moved. It's the most moving part of the research for the book, and I knew about it. If we go to slide two, um, you can see this scene, which is you know very a very kind of familiar scene to many historians, or you know in 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 you know 20th and 21st century culture it's a it's it's an image that many many of us have seen and and it was kind of deliberately so because it was a theatrical event on the 10th of may 1933 in berlin you know the uh, and you know the interesting thing to me is that it wasn't just jewish books that were destroyed it was the library of an institute of sexual studies um of human sexuality so there was gay literature and you know other literature about human sex sexuality that was deemed alongside you know the whole of jewish culture as being un-german and thrown by students and this was kind of shocking to me as well it's students who are throwing the books um that were being and, and filmed as they're doing so but again that act prompted an act of 
um, you know, there was horror and outrage, but it also prompted new libraries to be created. So exactly a year later, in 1934, in Paris, the German Freedom Library is established by Alfred Kantorowicz and with support from Andre Gide, Bertrand Russell and Thomas Mann. And, um, you know, Helen Keller um, wrote a letter saying, you know, to the student body in Germany saying, you can burn my books and the books of the best minds in Europe, but the ideas in them have seeped through a million channels and will continue to quicken other minds. So, you know, there's this, 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 this kind of urge to preserve the the German Freedom Library had 10,000 volumes, you know, a year later, there's another library similar in New York that's established at the same time. But of course, um, there's a perverse library that's created through the process of the Holocaust by um, Alfred Rosenberg's uh, you know, Hitler's kind of chief architect of anti-Semitism. And this library is formed by um, a team called the Einsatzstab Reichsleiter Rosenberg who fall in behind the Blitzkrieg as it moves into Central and Eastern Europe and they attack Jewish culture and a kind of cultural genocide that goes alongside the human genocide. And in Vilna, uh, I, there's this extraordinary group of librarians and scholars and poets who are selected from the ghetto in Vilna to sort through the libraries and archives of what was a fa amazing center, a rich, vibrant center of Jewish religion, Jewish culture, Jewish poetry, but not just of high culture, but of the lives of ordinary Jews, of Yiddish culture and Yiddish poetry and theater and cooking and, you know, everyday life is documented by an extraordinary institute called YIVO. And members of YIVO are selected by the Nazis to go and sort through archive and library collections, some of which are sent back to Rosenberg's perverted library collection back in Frankfurt and others to the paper mills for destruction and pulping. And they are horrified that they have to make these choices, but they smuggle, they, they, create diversionary tactics and they smuggle documents thousands of them back into the ghetto every night in their clothing and they risk their lives to preserve and to bear witness to keep the culture alive and it's a culture of the book and they bury it in the ghetto they hide it you know one of them digs a chamber 60 foot down and um, and then, of course, the, the occupants of the ghetto are murdered when it's liquidated in 1943, and a few of them, a handful, and they're called the Paper Brigade by the German guards. And they escape, some of them escape to join the partisans, and when the Soviets push the Nazis out, they come back into the ghetto and they find the collections again. It's extraordinary. I mean, it's, it's so compelling, this story. The... the, the um in in this 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 moment of 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 cataclysm um cultural cataclysm that, that there is that that ultimate need to keep witness it's your word it's but it's the witness that's what libraries and archives do keep yeah. witness alive by hiding as much of, the, of of this material as you possible as you say across all kinds of culture i mean you know i'm high low it didn't matter in the sense that what mattered was was actually keeping keeping alive um, the 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 that those millennia of of traditions and storytelling um, and keeping some record of it and they do and they are murdered many of them are murdered the vast majority of them murdered uh, and at the end of the war there is still something left there is still this extraordinary witness. Um, yeah. And then what happens to it? I mean, there's this uh, Gerhard Scholem. Well, I mean, I mean Scholem, the great um, friend of Walter Benjamin, the great, the great scholar in Jerusalem, he writes, you know, where Jews have migrated is where the books belong. You know, and I've been looking at that line thinking, I, oh, no, no, surely not. Um, hang on, Scholem, I don't agree. Um, yeah. What, Tell, tell us what happens next. It's so well, I, 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 again, I think this is, you know, it's absolutely 
incredibly fascinating and powerful. Um, and I'll say just a little bit about what happens, particularly in Vilna, because um, you know the the Yivo Institute is re-established after the Nazis are pushed out, and for a brief time, the you know they 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 can reconstruct the collections. They begin to collect again, and then the Soviets decide that these are anti-communist. And they were sent, the documents are all sent again to the paper mills. And, you know, you think, oh, my God. But this time they're rescued by a Lithuanian librarian called Antonas Ulpis, who goes to the paper mill and turns the trucks around and takes them back and hides them in an outpost of what becomes the National Library of Lithuania in a, in a, in a, 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 a former church, a big building which is full of Lithuanian books and documents. And he hides all these Jewish books in amongst them, including in the organ pipes. And he keeps them a secret to all but a handful of his trusted staff. And he dies and he keeps them a secret all through the time until 1989, when Glasnost and, uh, you know, Perestroika mean that, you know, there's an openness again. And in the meantime, he dies and suddenly the the presence of hundreds of thousands of pages of documents from this pre-holocaust era are revealed and it's a sensation and there there is you know uh, you know the yivo institute had been re-established in new york in the you know after 1939 and it had begun a new collection itself and then suddenly the staff there become it becomes clear to them that all these documents are, are there again. And then there's a, um, there's a kind of a cultural tussle between the national, you know, are these documents Lithuanian heritage? Is this part of our Lithuanian-ness to have these documents? Or are these Jewish documents that should follow the institution in an archival sense, the institution is still there. It's still going on. It's in New York. It's in the Lower East Side. And um, and what becomes, there, there becomes a kind of uh, a, a rapprochement, and that rapprochement is made available because of digitization. And so YIVO today is collaborating with the National Library of Lithuania to digitize the documents, which stay, are still part, are now part of the National Library of Lithuania's collections, but they're made available from the YIVO Institute globally through the internet. So, so this is, this, there's a sort of, um, uh, we, can, we can hold this as a sort of an example of, of, of of equilibrium, of finding, of finding something which is hugely positive out of out of, out of this. Where do things belong? Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, what's quite clear in in your book is that often this cannot happen. You know that there are yes. that, that, that there are live issues. There are issues of of, of uh, around power and justice yep. to, do, to do with archives where they belong and and who uh, uh, and who controls them that that are still hugely painful I mean, you begin your book with the windrush scandal the disaster disastrous grotesque um um um, um scandal of, of of the of the behavior of, of the government over the windrush um um communities and, and their destruction of, of those documents and and you end up well near the end talking very powerfully about um about FCO 141. Can you lead us into FCO 141? Because yeah, that abso ab all absolutely. kinds of territory. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm actually going to move the slide to slide 20, and not because it's relevant to FCO yeah. 141, uh, but just to get that image off the screen and to have something which is more uplifting. And this is Dina Abramovich, who uh, was the librarian in the Vilna ghetto and who survived the Holocaust and who ended up as a librarian at YIVO in New York. And I think it's better to yes, yes, thank you for have that. that on the screen. Yeah. I should have changed it earlier. But yeah. FDO 141 is, is an incredible um, story and it's part of, uh, again, this idea of the 
control of the archive being there is no political power without control of the archive and it's about who controls history under who is writing the narrative of the past and the past is so present in all of us today and it dictates many current events and uh, the process of decolonization is absolutely one of those which after world war ii many of the european powers of course went through this process and the archives that the colonial um uh, the col uh, you know the colonizing countries established in the former colonies when they were colonies um at the moment of independence are they the new national libraries and archives of the new countries, or are they just the archives of a branch of the government of the former colonial power? And so there's a point of um, di discussion and debate in that process of colonization, which at the time in the 1950s and 60s and even later, that the European powers and Britain this was really, really not our finest hour, um, have to make, and they make a mess of it generally, and they make horrendous, they make horrendous decisions. And many of those decisions are made kind of innocently, I think, as part of kind of record keeping practices. So archivists, will not keep every single document. They will go through a decision called retention and disposal, and they will sort what needs to be kept for long-term historical or legal and evidential value, and they'll destroy um, other records because you cannot afford to keep everything. And so some of the destructions that happened when, um, you know, former European powers left their colonial countries were were destructions and their 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 decisions which individual administrators um have to have to make but often they were those decisions were to hide malpractice by the colonial powers and to destroy evidence of corruption or um or or illegal behavior or um you know mistreatment of individuals and in particular, in Kenya, we find that the British government, um, at the, you know, uh, uh, who behaved so badly, so horrendously in the suppression of the Mau Mau rebellion, the archives that related to that episode, which were taken out of Kenya, were um, hidden by a foreign in a foreign office warehouse outside of London that became known as FCO 141. And um, it, its presence of, you know, miles of shelving is only revealed in 2011 through a court case. And those documents are then transferred from the, for the Foreign Office to the National Archives where they've been catalogued and they're available. And, um, you know, uh, people from Africa can come and access those records, not just of Kenya, but of other, other countries too. And so they can at last have access to what really happened, the evidence of, of that, um, that, that terrible episode in our history. So, so what we have is we've, 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 got, we've got parallel histories here going on. You know, uh, we've got um, systematic destruction of archives or, or their removal in order to, to close down the possibility of, of revising history, uh, restoring sense of, nas of, of nationhood of, or, or, of, or, of, or of justice, of finding justice. Um, but you also um, um, have the very powerful example um, in, in the book of what happens in East, well, in Germany around the Stasi um, records. Um, and very briefly, could you talk, touch on that? And then, I, then, and then I'm afraid we have to talk about all kinds of other <laughs> pressing things but but yeah. talk about the stasi archives because that's I, a very compelling interesting moment i i uh, yeah i think they're a very interesting case of how you can get it right yeah. with the preservation of knowledge and this is one where the urge to preserve was undertaken by individuals by ordinary citizens who marched into in um 1989 they marched into stasi headquarters excuse me, across Germany 
in a kind of co- you know I, I, and i haven't got to the bottom of actually how they managed to coordinate this in the days before whatsapp um but they managed to 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 do it um and they could see in places like erfurt and uh, leipzig that um and in berlin that that smoke was coming from the chimneys and they knew that these were records that would tell the truth and we had that quote from Orwell on the opening slide about, um, you know, if you can cling to the truth, you won't go mad. And what happens there is that the people of East Germany cling to the truth and they march into those offices and they stop the destruction of documents. So in some places they, they, they want to destroy it, but mostly they, they, the urge is there to preserve it. And gradually, over the next year or two years, those archives move into a new organisation. And that organisation is led by a Lutheran pastor called Joachim Gauck, who is one of the leaders of the, uh, the movement to um, you know, uh, th- overthrow the communist rule. And he's from the former East Germany, and he's given a role to establish an authority to look after the Stasi archives. And those archives include, were mostly the files kept on ordinary citizens by the Stasi, which included all the information gathered by their the people who informed on them. And so it's a what the the Gauk authority, as it becomes known, does is that it gives citizens the right to access their own Stasi file. Mm. And this is an extraordinary thing. And there's a most moving book by my Oxford colleague, uh, Timothy Gartnash, called The File. And he's a he's a, first a graduate student and then a journalist working in, in East Germany. And he discovers that he can access his own file. And what you understand by this process is that you can into you confronted with the fact that your friends your family members were all informing on you and this this um you know this act of openness is a way of confronting a difficult past and it was done it was handled very sensitively the gauk authority was extremely well resourced you know um individuals names were sometimes redacted and that whole kind of process was very very kind of carefully managed but millions of people applied to access their own files and that process of kind of understanding and confronting a difficult past help helped i think the process of um you know turning their back on what what had gone on and moving forward as a as a community as a society but, but they were allowed to do it they they had access to that they device. had access to it it was a right yeah. it was um and it was well resourced the whole process was carefully managed and um you know i contrast that in the book with what could have happened in iraq um if it if that process of archival control and access had been similarly resourced let's talk about access to knowledge because you know and then we need to we've got some extraordinary questions coming in left right and center access to knowledge because you know here we are in in a highly civilized country where in the last 10 years, we have lost 773 of our public libraries, um, 4,356 10 years ago, now only 3,500. We've lost 773 libraries in the last few years. Um, they are underfunded um, massively, significantly. Um, children uh, don't have that ability to have access, access to to public libraries in the way that you and I did when we were children and could walk down the street and borrow books and also be in a silent, quiet-ish place away from our families. So let's talk about access. What are the barriers to access to libraries? What are the barriers to access to, 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 to being able to grow through books? I think there's, um, well, that that process, you know, w- we've been fortunate in a country which has had a, well, a, a well-resourced a well public library system since the middle of the 19th century. 
and you know actually only became a legal requirement for local authorities to provide a publicly funded uh, library service from 1964. But before then, for about a century, it had been something that uh, local authorities were allowed to do by law. They could um, use use uh, the rate income from the rates to to fund those kind of activities, and many of them did. And that process of erosion has um, been a slow one, but it was absolutely revved up by the austerity regime and um, putting local authorities in the very um, uh, difficult position of having to choose between which public services to maintain. And of course, at the same time, there is a kind of feeling among many, I get confronted with it myself quite often by, you know, wealthy people who say, oh, you know, the libraries are irrelevant now. They're, 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 you know, everything's online. You can access everything online. And, you know, it may be true for kind of many people in affluent societies that they can afford to, you know, order books from Amazon or, you know, look up things which are on the internet. But for many individuals, that access to the internet is not present. They can't afford it or um, they're in a household which um, for which it, it, you know, control over that access is is difficult. Finding the peace and quiet in order to read and study is is very challenging. For many individuals, even accessing things like public benefits is now uh, an entirely online process, and they find it very very difficult. And libraries, public libraries, can often support individuals because there's free access to the internet, and there's somebody who can help you act. And navigate through complex interfaces who is on your side and not trying to stop you from you know from from being a successful claimant so there's a whole variety of public services which libraries provide but at the heart it's about education and about self-education and about self-discovery mm. and that process of self-discovery I benefited from myself and uh, in countries where, and in parts of the con this country, where public libraries are well resourced, um, because it's not a uniform picture of decline, um, public libraries are absolutely flourishing. In many parts of America, they've never been busier, and they're you know, and it's not just about getting access to the internet to you know check your Facebook page. It's about discovering new knowledge or accessing the tools um, or losing yourself in fiction which you might not have encountered before and and these opportunities I fear are being denied to a generation who are being denied so many other things and that generational inequality worries me a lot. Good. I'm, well it, I mean you you, you know the, your book is amongst many other things attract for our times in the sense that you have the most extraordinary coda um why we will always need libraries and archives which is a kind of call to action uh, richard which i i hugely respect we have so many questions that are coming in um but i have to have to have to go out to the world um a very interesting question um about nalanda the extraordinary uh library um of nalanda um, and why it's not talked about more. I have to say in my defense, um, on my on my um, my walls of the Library of Exile, I do actually, actually, Nalanda is one of the, the, the libraries that I, I do mention. Um, Richard, Nalanda, would you be able to talk about Nalanda for a second? No, I'm, I, I, I'm not, not sufficiently okay. um, okay. knowledgeable about, I'm not gonna stray and okay. betray my ignorance. One, one, one of the great Buddhist, well, yes. it's part of the pantheon of, 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 of extraordinary libraries that were, have been destroyed over the last uh, a couple of thousand years. I mean, you begin your book with actually with Alexandria and the myths around Alexandria. Nalanda really um, um, is, is, is its equal in, in terms of, 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 of the power. Uh, the, the extraordinary depth of its collections and, and, and the pain of its of its destruction. Um, a, a question, very interesting question about 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 um, the Palestinian diaspora and about about recording and archiving um, the experience of, of of Palestinian the Palestinian experience, um, and obviously that could lead us to the. I have to say the destruction of some of uh, um, in, in Gaza and in the West Bank of of, of libraries um, in the last um, fifteen years. I mean, twenty years uh, since the first intifada. So that we see again um, 
um, that actually libraries are are places where, which have a huge marker on them, saying uh, of, of places yeah. of danger, places where where um, where the contingency of, of knowledge is 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 there, and, and people want to destroy them because they are places where where important and significant things happen. And I think that um, one of the things which is happening, which is a very kind of inspiring thing that's happening at the moment, and has been happening for a few years, is what I call activist archivists. So groups who are documenting knowledge either by capturing websites, which are, you know, Palestinian websites, where are being cyber attacked from Israel, um, uh, so there are groups that archive those websites and trying to archive culture that has a, a, an expression online. But they're also digitizing vulnerable collections. And there are various kind of uh, groups who are active in that field, whether they're, you know, it's happening in Yemen with the Zaidi community, which are uh, librarians from Leiden and from Stanford, uh, so, sorry, from Princeton, who are very active in that field also in Italy. Um, there are groups who are working, there's the Endangered Archives Programme, which um, the Arcadia F Foundation support and which is administered from the British Library, which is, you know, in funding teams to do uh, particularly uh, important digitization of you know ar archives and sound recordings and all sorts of uh, knowledge collections in vulnerable places including Palestine so um, there are these kind of impulses to preserve which are happening um, you know right now and those collections will be passed to institutions like mine and to other uh, you know better funded in, uh, institutions for that preservation task and um, you know it's very important for us in in places like the Bodleian and the other uh, great libraries around the world that we take this current urgent these current urgent issues very very seriously it, yes I mean the the, the imperative um, the, of your book, the imperative of this particular moment is 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 extraordinary in that um, you know this is a an unfolding history, isn't it? I mean we've you know we um, um, the Library of Exile itself is going as as you know to to Mosul to be part of the rebuilding of of a library that was only destroyed five years ago by by ISIS. Um, no. that, that that appalling um, um, act of of a, 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 the attempted erasure of what is it an erasure of? It's an erasure of, of otherness, of sort of polyphonic knowledge, of, of knowledge which takes you in different directions. Yep. It's an erasure of, 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 of histories, plural histories. It's an erasure of different languages and of translation, which is something would be another few hours for us to talk about. Yep. Um, so it, ha it, it continues to happen year by year by year by year. But your, po your, your book is... is, is also full of this alternative uh, parallel history of people who, who, who find ways of making things happen, <laughs> making, of, of, of preserving, of, 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 uh, and, and, and changing the course of their part of, 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 of history through witness. Yeah, and I think, I think that's something which in our current moment, here at the end of the you know this 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 extraordinary year and hopefully at the beginning of a new one that will bring better things uh to the world we must we must ensure that we take the preservation of knowledge as being of fundamental importance for democracy for um communities that are under threat that um, can take sucker from the fact that their their own histories, their own culture, their own, the richness of their language and literature and poetry and music is is being preserved and treasured and is available to them, and that other communities can control their own narrative and not have it imposed upon them and that um you know if we go to slide 27 uh, you know um you know orwell's warning lesson to us all the past was erased the erasure was forgotten the lie became truth you know in an in in a, a, a 
this moment when we see the end of a political regime in America that has specialized in, um, you know, the erasure of the past and the replacement with alternate facts, um, that and how important that is for democracy itself and for the rights of citizens um, that, you know, we need libraries and archives more than we ever have, I think. And let's go into a new, um, a new year resolved to, um, to support them and, and to, to, to preserve knowledge. Yes, you say in your great coda, which I have to say, I, I, this is this I'd say is everyone, but <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. But, um, they pr libraries provide a fixed reference point, allowing truth and falsehood to be judged through transparency, verification, citation, and reproducibility. I mean, you you make you make the point that in, that in this in this difficult, dangerous moment when when tweets um, and are uh, are. Uh, uh, toxically infecting um, conversation about, about, about what may or may not be truthful, um, that you do need places which actually hold knowledge in depth, yeah. places you can actually go to and check things out. Absolutely, and check it out for ourselves and have trust that there is a provenance trail on that information that it can be it can be verified that we can know who the author was that the content hasn't been tampered with that there is a freedom to access it that um, we're not going to be judged or um, you know intervened in that process of of accessing the knowledge and creating new knowledge from it and I think that all of these things are part and parcel of what libraries and archives should do in a healthy society. Yeah. And, and actually, there will always be a pushback. There will always be a pushback. And in fact, questions just come in saying, you know, have there been adverse reactions to the Library of Exile? And absolutely there have. I mean, you know, I've, mm. I haven't exactly had hate mail, but there, but, you know, um, but there have been people who have been very um, uh, cheery of, of, of it and uh, questioned its... Um, you know why it's there um, and what it's doing, and um, and obviously do not like the idea of having. Um, really, um, that's extraordinary. I mean, it's... But, but you know that's what happens, isn't it? You, yeah. you, know, um, <laughs> you know, all you can do is, is is to write write books, make libraries, and talk to people. I mean, those are those are kind of the, the things we can do. Absolutely, and we can converse with not only with each other but with the past and with the future and i think that's um you know where a kind of a, a time machine libraries are in both directions and you know now in this age we need to remember that where we are today is being the creation of uh, a past and if we are to go forward into the future with confidence knowledge of the stepping stones that we can use to guide us into that future yeah. so that's why we do history that's why we that's why we are passionate passionately committed to looking at the past uh, um um with 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 clarity and and with and with conviction to 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 really search search out what has happened in order to partly in order to to avoid the the well, it's the epigraph of your book. It's also on on the wa the walls of my library, the Heinrich Heine, great um, yep. right, epigraph from from two hundred years ago. Dort wo man Bucher verbrennt, verbrennt man auch am Ende Menschen. Where books are burned, in the end, people will also be burned. You know, you take out the books because you're trying to close down and destroy culture and destroy people. Yep. So you look back and you look at that history. Uh, and that, that gives you power for the future. And I thought that was one of the most powerful things about walking into the Library of Exile is seeing the, if you like, the the negative spaces of the, the, the losses alongside the living knowledge of those books. And I like the fact that they were contemporary editions. You know, they were, you know, there were paperbacks and, uh, and the fact that they will go on to be read by uh, people you know, perhaps some of them not even born yet. Um, well, you know, it, I'm, it's 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 a wonderful thing to spend an evening with you, Richard, and and in the company of so many people out there, and to be talking um, with such um, with such power uh, um, 
uh, about the history, the plurality of histories and possibilities you, you do. Just before we go, because we have to leave and people will need to get away to their other lives, perhaps ending, Richard, um, a wonderful and moving thing from your book, one of the many things, which is Thomas Jefferson's great, great quote. I mean, I, you may remember it from, but I have it here. Um, and I'm afraid the language is, 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 is gendered, but it, here we go. He who receives an idea from me receives instruction himself without lessening mine. As he might light his taper at mine, he who lights his taper at mine receives light without darkening me. So you light the taper, you light your own candle and others light them and on goes the light, on and on and on and on, but without any diminution of your own light. Richard, surely that is the definition of why you might want to be a librarian. <laughs> it most absolutely is, yeah. Jefferson's taper is, is a kind of uh, a rallying cry for librarians as guardians of the truth and, uh, uh, you know, illuminators for society through that core act of preservation of knowledge and sharing it as widely as possible. So bring on the light, more light. I think that's the most marvellous way of ending. Richard, it's a huge privilege uh, to have had this hour with you. Thank you so much for joining us from wherever you are. Um, please stay well in these difficult times. Remember the taper, lighting the taper and the light continuing. It's a good metaphor to, to stay with you. Please, if you can, support the British Museum. Um, keep tuning in to all the wonderful things that the British Museum is, is helping push out into the world and, and be well. And it's goodbye from all of us here. So thank you. Th thank you, Edmund. Wonderful conversation. Thank you.